All right, welcome uh, world history students. We are on our, our second lecture for the week and still talking about ancient Israel. And the last lecture we looked at the covenant that brought Israel into a relationship with God and began to set them apart from the other uh, nations of the world. Um, and this lecture looks at how they worshiped. Um, what was the actual uh, uh, procedure in which that allowed you know the, the, the Israelites to worship their new God, Yahweh. So let's go ahead and take a look here. And again, there's questions on your slide deck that um, will allow you to, whoops, let's go get back to that, uh, questions on the slide deck that this lecture will help you to answer. Alrighty, so first we want to talk about the purpose. What's the purpose behind Israel's worship? What were they, all the religious things, you know, all the ceremonies and rituals that they would do, what was the purpose behind it? Um, that could be summarized pretty much in one word, that word up here, atonement, um, the, uh, to make atonement for their sins. And that word atonement it basically means to make one. I kind of just look at the word and it says at one mint in that it wants to bring two parts of something that are broken and want to, when you atone for that, you put those parts back together and you make them one. What was ripped apart is being brought back together whenever we are quote unquote, or whenever we're seeking quote unquote atonement. Um, and this is just a reference to man's natural state, you know, that according to the to the Hebrews, man's natural state is one of sin, that we have missed the mark, that we have rent ourselves or torn ourselves away from our creator, from our God who created us to have relationship with him, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden. And then when they sinned, it was it wasn't that they ate fruit that was the sin, but that they disobeyed God and said, you know what, we're going to tear ourselves away from what you meant to be one. We're going to separate and we're going to go our own way. And when they did that, they missed the mark. Um, missing the mark is actually the uh, the translation of the biblical word for sin. It was the idea of an archer who would take aim at a target and then they would stray and miss the target. And that is sin. Um, with the idea that uh, the target that we're all aiming for as humans is our God, our Father in heaven. And so whenever we aim at our God and we seek our God, we are in right, we're righteous and in right relationship. Uh, whenever we turn and say, you know what, I want this, I want something other than God then whatever that thing specifically happens to be, then that is sin. Um, and so the purpose of atonement is to basically bring that that aim or bring that target back on track and bring what has been ripped apart or what has been diverted back into being one. Um, and so the purpose of atonement is to make relationship between God and sinful man possible. You've got a perfect righteous God and you have a sinful, rebellious, fallen human being how do we get those two things to talk to each other? Because if God is righteous and can't be in the presence of sin or sin is destroyed in his presence, and then he's got this creation that he wants to know, but that sin kind of comes in between them, uh, how are you going to remove that so that they can actually get back together and be at one or atoned for? Um, and the idea is we're going, the whole Israel or Hebraic uh, form of worship is to remove that separation and remove that sin by atoning for it. Um, this would not only bring uh, God and man at one or into atonement and relationship, but also would bring human beings uh, with one another, society, together um, as one. Because sin not only separates us from God, my sins separate me from other people as well. And so that's what the Hebrew worship was all about. How do we atone for this separation and remove this sin? All right, so how do they, how do they try to remove uh, that sin or that separation? Uh, the idea is that the price uh, for sin, which is death, the penalty for this sin, because sin is a violation of God's law. It's a violation of God's character. And rather than that being laid upon us and we coming into God's presence and being judged and destroyed, the whole idea of, of Jewish worship is to take that sin and lay it upon a sacrifice, lay it upon an animal sacrifice um, whose blood, the loss of their life, would be a propitiation or a replacement uh, for the 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 penalty that I deserve as the one who had sinned. And so that's why you see animal sacrifice and other types of sacrifices at the heart of Jewish worship um, and a lot of other uh, religions as well, because there's this idea that we are we are letting go of this valuable uh, life. And again, they didn't sacrifice these animals because they meant nothing to them. They sacrificed them because these animals were their livelihood. These animals were their their food and their provision and their their labor force and their, their currency, their money. And so they're laying those down and saying, I will lay this down. It will take its blood will replace mine um, in order to remove my my sin. And so the big practice, you can see the picture there, that high priest, that's the high priest in the Holy of Holies. He's sit sitting above what's called the mercy seat. And that was the place where God's presence was said to dwell in the Jewish tabernacle. We'll look at some pictures of that in a minute. And it was they would sprinkle the blood on the altar in order to um, 
again, saying this is in, in place of the sin and the judgment that the people deserve. Um, therefore, the, paying the price, paying the, the, the consequence of sin so that it's removed. So now that those the, the man and God who are separated by that sin can come back together into relationship. Um, the tabernacle, that's the kind of the tent um, of meeting. It's also called the tent that uh, Moses is instructed how to build it in the wilderness during the wandering years of Sinai. That's the meeting place between God and man. A tabernacle is a place where heaven meets earth. And it, the most special place inside that tabernacle was this place called the Holy of Holies. And that was the central room where God's presence and that mercy seat, a lot of times another name for the mercy seat was the Ark of the Covenant for all you Indiana Jones fans. Uh, that was the mercy seat on top of that. It's described as having the two angels on top or cherubim. And inside it's where they kept the Ten Commandments and Moses' rod and a jar of manna. Um, but it was there where they, only the high priest would enter into that Holy of Holies where God's presence was there. Um, in order to make atonement for the sins of the people so that they could be brought back into right relationship uh, with their God. Um, that was the primary sacrifice that was made, but they had a whole calendar and procedure of various sacrifices. And I'm not going to go into each one of these, but some of them were voluntary. Uh, you could make them whenever you wanted to honor God or worship God or celebrate a blessing or some, some income. Uh, or sometimes they were the other ones were obligatory. If you sinned or you had to routinely make them because it was understood that you were sinning. Um, and so these offerings, again, they were meant to say, I've done wrong, God, or I want to enter into your presence, God. I want peace with you, God. Um, I want to thank you, God. And before you could do that, because of sin, we're separated by sin, we would make an atonement, make a sacrifice so that then we could have that interaction or the Jews could have that interaction uh, with their God. Um, lots of different things could be offered. You can see that all the sin offerings, were there, usually the animals, because they had to have blood, life for life. Um, if it was an actual sin, uh, or the, the, you see the turtle doves, the birds, the pigeons, but then a lot of times the peace offerings or the, uh, uh, the some of the uh, other uh, burnt off, not burnt offerings, but the, a lot of the cereal offerings, those could be think grains like flour, wheat, uh, cakes, stuff like that. And a lot of times they're, you know, even, even oil and stuff, uh, olive oil. That there is a picture of the tabernacle. Um, as described in Exodus. And we'll talk about all the different implements that went that are in that picture next. So it, parts of worship, uh, the main thing you can see in the center there, that is the Ark of the Covenant or the mercy seat. That was what was placed in the Holy of Holies. Um, you can see the poles that were passed through. And again, if you've seen Indiana Jones, they did a recreation of that. Um, that was where the blood would be sprinkled on the Day of Atonement um, by only the high priest. So nobody ever really saw that but the high priest. And it would be covered and carefully carried uh, whenever they traveled. Um, uh, that was that was the center. That was supposed to be the throne that God came and sat on um, uh, during when He was with His people. Uh, the, th the little box on the left you see carrying poles with that too. That was the altar. That's where the burnt offerings would be made. It was basically a barbecue. Um, you could see the grating just like a barbecue, and they could light the coals and the fire underneath it, and it was made of bronze. Um, and so that's where the, the sacrifices would be burned. Uh, the man washing his hands. That was known as the, the bronze laver. Uh, that was where the priests purified themselves and washed their hands during, you know, uh, was basically, in a sense, a, a, a holy butcher shop. Um, and so they you had to be ritually pure before they went did any of the different acts of worship. And the little tall box on the right, that was the altar of incense. Um, and that was placed inside the tabernacle, just outside the Holy of Holies, um, and continually lit, offering up this, this incense, um, pretty much representative of both the presence of God as well as the prayers of the people rising up for God to hear. And so you can see that altar of incense in this picture. The priest is outside the Holy of Holies, um, which was separated by its own curtain. And there he is at the altar of incense uh, preparing to enter. So we have the, bron the, the, the bronze laver, the Ark of the Covenant, the, uh, the, the altar, and then the, the altar of incense. Uh, the high priest himself, uh, he would be from the tribe of Levi. A descendant of Levi, um, and then he kind of he. You can re look at the different uh, accoutrements. The main thing I want to point out is that he wore this thing called the breastplate of justice, uh, of judgment, and on it there were twelve stones, and there was a specific stone type for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. Um, and then he had uh, these stones up on his shoulder. Those were the Uman and the Thuman, and those were two stones used to cast lots. You'll read sometimes in the Bible to kind of discern the wheel. The, the, it was kind of like a magic eight ball in a way, but it had basically a yes and a no. They would ask God questions and then the, he could take those stones and use those 
and whichever one fell out first, that would be God's answer. Yes, do this. No, don't do that. Um, and so this is what the high priest would wear and also what he would wear when entering into the Holy of Holies. So that as he walked in wearing those stones, uh, he's representing the seeking of the will of God and for representing the sins and the atonement of the entire people of Israel, all 12 tribes. Uh, there is a you know a depiction of, of the Umen, of the Urim and the Thummim. Sorry, mispronouncing that. Um, kind of saying God agrees or God does not agree. Uh, a recreation of the tabernacle. Again, you can see the altar, the barbecue out front, along with a bronze laver. Um, inside would be the, the holy place, and then there would be a second curtain separating the holy of holies, where the ark of the covenant uh, would be kept. Uh, another depiction of it. Um, you can, a couple of things I didn't mention, but you can see the what looks like, like a, a big candle. That's the, uh, the the lamp stand, and that would be continually lit and burning with olive oil. Um, the light's never meant to go out to signal again the presence of God. Um, the, it's not technically a menorah. Maybe you've had those, or you celebrate Hanukkah, and they have the uh, the eight days of, of Hanukkah. That the the one in the tabernacle though was similar. It was a um, uh, it had seven, it had one in the middle, and then the three, uh, the three on the outside. Again, God's symbols, the number seven being of perfection, uh, as well as of the you know the days of creation. And then you had a table of what was called the showbread, and this was bread brought in for the offering, um, and it was uh, baked freshly each day, and it was an offering to the Lord, as well as um, I believe uh, sustenance for the, the the priests who were able to eat that. The priests, while they would sacrifice and burn parts of the animals that were sacrificed or the grain that was brought. They would also that was actually even the sustenance for them, and they would use it to eat um, and feed the uh, all the different priests working with the tabernacle. Uh, just a diagram of the process of entering into. This is looking down a schematic of the tabernacle, where you would alter in, you would make the sacrifice, a form of confession. You would then cleanse yourself with the bronze laver, representing forgiveness. The holy place filled with the candles, the candle stand, lamp stand, and the incense. It was a place of worship, and then. Only the high priest then could actually be atoned for or cleaned enough to then step in and represent uh, the people before the Holy of Holies. So it was this process. We're talking about a system of worship that allows sinful man to encounter uh, their God and have a relationship. And this was the process. This was the process of sacrifice, forgiveness, worship, and then being in God's presence. It was all about relationship. Later on, that desert tabernacle would take the form of a of a temple and you have famously described in in uh second samuel uh uh and chronicles uh solomon's temple where again what was a temporary tent that was taken up and put in put down while the israelites moved became a permanent structure in jerusalem um, but it followed although on an incredibly much grander scale it followed the exact same uh, worship procedures um you had the altars outside you had massive uh you had massive uh pools uh, they were called the sea um, in which they could be do the cleansing, and then you would enter the holy place, and that's where you had multiple lamb stands and multiple tables of showbread, and then there would you would rise into an altar, and you can see this uh, the, the two cherubim in the back and the little tiny ark of the covenant seated between them. It was the exact same format that we're describing, only again much grander, totally inlaid with gold to emphasize the preciousness and the and the sacredness of the space. Again, a temple being a place, a meeting place of heaven and earth, where God can meet and interact with with man with god can meet and interact with man and lastly the form of their worship in addition to the sacrificial system was just the series of feasts the holidays or holy days and again these are mandated in the pentateuch mandated by the covenant god saying here are, in order to have a relationship with me here's when we party here's when we get together here's the times that we need to recognize um and we'll go over these in a second but uh basically want to point out there was there were kind of two seasons of it there was a spring season known as the former rain and there was a fall season known as the latter rain. And we'll talk about the, 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 the different feasts um, in each, each uh, period. But again, this was, again, part of upholding the covenant, a relationship with God. It was to, God said, you know, we got to party. We got to have, these are week-long festivals that, although solemn in their own way, were also a time to stop working, a chance to celebrate, a chance to focus on God, focus on each other and what God had, and to remember uh, their, their history. So there's a historical tie to the first four uh feasts and then kind of a prophetic tie to the to the other ones uh the former reign you probably heard of passover uh we'll get when we get into christianity you'll see that's that's uh becomes linked with jesus and his sacrifice but 
uh, before it was just a remembrance of the of the exodus um, it was a chance to remember there that God had passed over the angel of death had passed over the homes of the Hebrews um, it went because they had painted the blood of the lamb on their door and it only struck uh, in Egyptian homes um, this is also known as the as the festival of unleavened bread uh, because again they didn't want, want to wait for their the bread to rise uh, you know with yeast which is what leaven is they were so quickly to be ready to escape from Exodus that they 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 did they had unleavened bread so that it would be ready quickly and took the form of instead of fluffy bread kind of the cracker known as matzah. Um, uh, then uh, shortly after that they had the the the, the f festival of first fruits where they would celebrate the spring harvest um, and then 50 days after Passover they would have the festival of weeks um, later known as Pentecost or also known as Pentecost where they celebrate having left the, the escaped through Egypt, you know, during the Exodus, uh, experiencing the first fruits of freedom, and then the 50 days later of the, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. So each of the holidays was meant to kind of walk the the Jews through uh, this Exodus process of escaping, of being set free, and then receiving the law or the covenant with God. And so when they celebrated their holidays, it reminded them of the story of the Jewish people. Um, and then the latter rain, the fall festivals, was actually where we are right now. Uh, they had they have the festival of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. That's the Jewish New Year. The Jewish New Year begins um, in September. So we're actually I'm recording this on the uh, the first Rosh Hashanah is going to begin at sundown tonight, uh, September day, September uh, 18th. Um, and so that was their celebration of their 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 new beginning. Uh, that was followed, I think, around 10 days later by Yom Kippur, which was the holiest day. Yom Kippur means Day of Atonement. Um, and so it, although the sacrifices would be made throughout the year in various ways, it was on the day of atonement that the high priest would actually enter the Holy of Holies and make the sacrifice for the entire uh, nation of Israel. Uh, it was a day of prayer and fasting, of self-examination, a day of basically we're entering our new year. So now we want to start off the new year clean. We want to start the new year off in good relationship with our God. And so we're going to be judged. We're going to become we want to we want to we judge ourselves. We want to make the sacrifice and be atoned for. Um, and then the Festival of Booths, Sukkot, uh, is just a, is a, a festival remembering the time of wandering within the Sinai Desert. And so the, the Jews today, they would build booths um, in order to remind themselves that they once did not have homes. They once did not have a promised land, that they once were, were uh, uh, wanderers in the wilderness and God alone looked after them. And so even today, Orthodox Jews during the Festival of Booths um, in late September, we'll go out, a lot of them will, will leave their homes and live in their backyards or they'll camp outside their businesses to remind themselves of, you know, those times when they were just wanderers and had no, had no home. These festivals are kind of important. It's pretty powerful when we get into Christianity because each one seems to be prophetic uh, towards uh, uh, something either in Jesus's life or something promised in Jesus's second coming. But we'll, we'll save that for the, uh, the Christianity section. All right, so so what? Jewish worship. Uh, you want to get the, the one that there's two key components here that God demands justice. Sin has to be dealt with. There's no way for sinful man to be in the presence of a perfectly righteous God. He, he, if you're, he's totally good, he has to judge evil. He has to judge wickedness. Consequence must be paid. And so he can't just look at his creation and be like, hey, you're a bunch of lying, thieving, murdering, jealous, envious, unfaithful people. Let's hang out. He wouldn't be a good God then. So he has to administer justice. But the whole worship process shows that he desires to extend mercy. He's saying, hey, Jews, I know you're sinful. My people, I know you've fallen short and I can't let that go. But here's how you can atone for it. Here's how we can come back to being one. Um, and so it's a Ju Judaism introduced this balance of justice and mercy. He is a good, righteous God, ethical monotheism. But he's going to extend mercy to his people so that he doesn't just have to judge us and destroy him. Um, again, that idea of the penalty of sin must be paid. He's not just going to let sin go. There must be a way for it to be paid um, or else he's not a good, just God. Um, and the idea that God is in seeking atonement with man to make relationship possible. The whole crux of the Jewish religion was not, again, God's control or dominion or mastery of the human beings or human beings crying out, the Jews crying out, oh God, please, you know, change the weather or give us a good harvest or whatever. It was all about to bring, to honor that covenant, that creation of a relationship and to create a people who knew their God and a God who was able to pass on uh, to a people the way they're supposed to live, the way they're supposed to fully become of who they intended them to be way back in the garden that was lost. But now God's trying to bring about a reconciliation and a return 
uh, to what to humans and their full potential. And he's going to use Abraham's family, the Jews, uh, to do that. In order to do that, they need their uh, this process of atonement. All right, so we'll we'll talk to you soon, and we'll discuss some of that in class.